the the the, the yearly progress report of microcore and this time uh, I have kind of a revolutionary news. Um, I have converted to bytes. Oh, microcore has converted to bytes. So, how did this come about? I implemented uh, IP, UDP, and uh, ARP on microcore on a cell addressed machine, and it worked pretty efficiently. Um, and it worked pretty efficiently because I did a lot of processing already in the FPGA. So the processor uh, doesn't have to decide whether a message is meant uh, for himself, but this is done by the FPGA. The FPGA knows, of course, what the broadcast address is, minus one. It also knows its own IP address, or uh, it, it, especially its own, uh, how is this called? Ah, a MAC address. And uh, all the processing, like uh, checking the CRC and uh, inspecting the MAC addre target address, whether it is meant uh, for my node, uh, is done in the FPGA. And then there is just an interrupt if there is a message for this very node. And, and that works nicely. But Looking at the amount of code needed for a full IP protocol stack implementation, I came to the conclusion that it would be much more efficient to realize byte addressing in microcore rather than recoding the entire protocol stack for cell addressing. Uh, because a byte address processor can reuse most of MPE's IP protocol stack, uh, thanks to Steven and his uh, implementation in the ARM uh, software suite. So byte addressing, microcore needs byte addressing. And I found a, a very nice implementation. Um, because it turned out that uh, teaching microcore byte addressing did take much less time than the time I wasted during the past 20 years explaining why byte addressing is not needed at all. So that was just stupid by, from me. Um, a new VHDL constant uh, called byte address width has been introduced and it may take the following values, zero, then there are no bytes. Everything as is as it was before, you get a cell addressed machine and the data width may be any width, I mean, practically, from 10 bits up to uh, given the present cross compiler 32 bits, later on when the cross compiler runs on 64 bit system, um, and this is why I wait for GeForce 1.0, uh, it will compile up to a data width of 64 bits. If the byte address width is one, then we do have one bit to address a byte, which means we have a 16 bit machine and therefore data width has to be set to 16. And the same is, uh, or the similar case is with the 32 bit machine, their byte address width is two because you need to be able to address four bytes and then you have to set data widths to 32. Um, the result of all of this is as far as resource use, uh, usage is concerned, a byte address machine needs about 10% more logic, which is, well, given the functionality, it's quite a bit, but it involves a lot of uh, multiplexing uh, bytes uh, through the, I'm talking about 32-bit machine through the four different positions uh, and, and, and that just eats up log logic cells, but it works. The next topic, uh, while I was there uh, working on the internals and after byte addressing, I had to revisit all my test suites I had written before because now also needed to 
be capable uh, to handle the white cases. And then I finally stumbled uh, across my test routines for signed, unsigned uh, division and multiplication. And in the past, I have uh, done this using a fuzzy approach. And that always left me with an uneasy feeling because I didn't test every case. Um, so, an exhaustive test routine that would test all possible numbers dividing a double integer dividend by a single integer divisor. And that test routine compiled into 1,020 instructions and therefore it would be executable by a 10-bit machine. And that's what I did. I made a 10-bit machine to execute exactly these tests. And this reduced the time needed for a full test. That means really two by the power of 30 tests will be done uh, in about five hours. So that is manageable. And I could run a full test suite. And the result was very interesting. Uh, basically, the test routine works as follows. Uh, I, I fetch the dividend, I fetch the divisor, uh, I do a m divide mod, I multiply the quotient with the divider and add the remainder, and it should then be the same as the dividend, if it is, works correctly numerically. And uh, so, yeah. If the result equals the dividend, we have a correct result and should have no overflow. And the following four cases uh, may occur in the test routines. First, a correct result and the overflow bit is not set, so this is okay. A correct result, but the overflow set, this is an error, of course. An incorrect result with the overflow bit set, that's okay. And an incorrect result with the overflow not set, that is definitely an error. And uh, in, in the full sweep, uh, I detected several cases of, uh, of error type four, and I was able to fully debug the overflow generation code. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the, in the end, the code to set the overflow correctly was less complex than what I had before with errors in it. Okay, and that was it. Uh, here, uh, if you want to take a uh, look at MicroCore and its current state, uh, it is available on GitHub and it also has a, a lot of documentation. That's it. Oh, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh -huh. Okay, we have Gerald. Yes, uh, Klaus, thank you for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how many practical applications do you know of Microforce? Because I recall that some companies were using it. Do you still have contact to them or how's the situation there? Uh, um, uh, I lately, I made a presentation on, on the project I, I have been doing with Microcore and there were more projects than I thought of. So at least six large I mean, substantial projects where MicroCore is in the very middle. And then there is uh, one company, SpaceTech, uh, in Immenstadt uh, on the Lake of Constance. Um, they are using MicroCore for the engineering model of a satellite. Uh, now, how do you call this? Uh, for the experiment for a satellite. Uh, but that's that's all. I mean, I'm not aware of any other company using it, which which of course I want to change. Okay. And, and next after wait a second, I want to add this, uh, which is something I want to change. And uh, after visiting uh, the German academia crowd uh, of the uh, new. Uh, compiler approaches. 
I am pretty confident that this could be launched through the academic institutions and to, through students uh, uh, to, to get a hang of it. Uh, next question from Band. Yeah, one, one thing I found when I implemented B16 is that the protocols you have to talk to the outside usually think about bytes and it's, that's why you implement bytes. And so I implemented bytes very early on because I used I2C and SPI interfaces and uh, it's just the interfaces. The rest of the world talks in bytes. So you just found out the same way, but later bytes is what you use as interface granularity tokens. Yeah, I, of course, I have done different various versions of SPI and whatnot. And it was really never a problem to uh, execute these protocols um, on on a cell addressed machines, especially since all the front end processing is done by the FPGA. Um, so the only valid argument that I accept for byte addressing is if there is a large software package that is really broadly used in industry, that is going to be programmed in bytes and then you need a byte processor or else you would have to i mean rewrite the entire software which doesn't make sense mm -hmm. yeah okay and we have That's a, a uh, carry on uh, we have a um we have another raised hand from howard yeah hi um Krauss, excellent work. Uh, I, I love what you're doing. The test that you did with the 10-bit wide system that takes five hours, how confident are you if you create a 32-bit system that the test applies to that? Oh, I'm sure that it does because, uh, I mean, all the cases that I caught in the 10-bit version will uh, with numerically different, but with the same bit pattern, so to speak, will occur in other versions. And and the, the basic routine, I mean, there are three instructions involved in, in signed and unsigned divisions. And there is an instructions to set up parameters. Then there is this, the, the single step instruction that you execute once for every bit. And then there is a final cleanup instruction. And, <clears throat> and the, the real, the changes I had to make was in the last step. The last step that decides whether uh, the overflow bit has to be set or not. And, uh, and, that, and, and, and the situation will be the same for any, uh, any bit widths and, uh, Especially, it own, this only applies to the uh, bit step instruction, which uh, always has been right. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I have a question as well. Uh, as a relative newbie in the uh, uh, in the fourth community, uh, what what do you envisage as like the um, uh, the core use case for microcore. Um, what what's its kind of competitive edge against other processors? Yeah, uh, the the primary use case is complex uh, embedded systems, where you do need an FPGA anyways, and then why not put the processor on it as well? So that saves you one multi-pin package and makes uh, board layout easier as well. Um, and then microcore has some features that other processors don't have. For one thing, you have a you you are absolutely free in defining the word widths with which you want to work. And so I found that very often I'm using 27 bits. Well why? Uh, 
I, at some point I found that the internal block RAM memories in the FPGAs tend to be nine bits wide, not eight bits. And so why throw away this extra bit and three times nine is 27. So very often I, I work with 27 bits. 27 bits is also always also very nice for floating point because floating point, at least in the numerical range that I needed, works perfectly on 27 bits. It works more or less perfectly depending on how, how wide the dynamics of your floating point function are, also on 24-bit systems, and below that, forget it. Um, but above 24 bits is fine. And then it is very fast. I mean, microcore has been designed for interruptibility in mind in the first place. And so the longest interrupt latency that the processor itself introduces is two instructions. So that is usually 80 nanoseconds. And the multitasker never has to disable interrupts. That has to do with the fact that I have a plus store that is uh, interrupt safe. So that is an undivisible instruction. And um, then it has a feature that to my knowledge only the transputer has had before. And that is the so-called pause input. And using, so that is a hardware input that kind of executes a pause instruction and, and goes to the scheduler and looks whether anything else has to be done. This means that you can fully implement mutual exclusion and, uh, and resource management of, in a multitasking system. You can do that in hardware. And you don't have to set up semaphores and then query a semaphore and whatnot. You just do a fetch on the ADC and that will give you the result. And maybe it takes a while and other tasks run in between because the fetch, if the ADC is not yet ready, the fetch will trigger a pause. Mm -hmm. and, and I have extensively used this in the last project, which, which was a satellite project was uh, four ADCs, about eight DACs, uh, and five parallel running tasks. So that, that was quite the, the most complex uh, thing I have ever done. And with the uh, uh, using the pause for the mutual exclusion uh, in hardware, it, it was beautiful. I never had to worry about that. And I could just go ahead and program uh, it uh, as if it would be accessible, the resources would be accessible exclusively to one task. Okay, but yeah, I can see how that's a compelling yeah. uh, and, and as, set. As, as far as speed is concerned, I mean, microcore is so performant, um, you have about an order of magnitude a better timing results of the things you want to do. Mm -hmm. so, so you can do many things that previously had to be done in hardware. Okay. In, in uh, that I'm... respect, it is very similar to the RTX 2000, for instance. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more quick question from uh, Stephen Pelt. Klaus, what's, what's the use case for, for a TCP IP stack on a... Yeah, it depends on, on how big your system is. Uh, I was thinking about uh, Internet of Things and the least you need there is uh, IP UDP. And I implemented it and it is uh, very dense. It, if I remember this correctly, uh, it takes about 800 logic cells uh, on the FPGA, which is not too much. And also it does the whole thing in, I think it's it's around a thousand instructions in code. So it's compact. And so you can implement it in a, what I call a, a, 
a, a single chip system in that you do not have any external RAM. You just use the internal RAM of the FPGA and uh, that's it. Okay. I'm glad to see the stack still moves along. So it's, it's... The other thing is that, that at one stage it was actually quite fashionable to use to put a little web server on the, on the device. Um, and to put what control. on a device? Put a web server on a device. Okay. And use it for configuration. So it was essentially the technician setup to yeah. Um, yeah, possible use cases. Uh, anyway, I came to the conclusion that if microcore is going to be used for serious projects, it needs the IPs. Uh, I mean, at least UDP. Well, I, I'm sure you. I'm, I'm sure you're right, and it also opens up thing, you know, opens up access to other byte-oriented protocols. None of us may love USB, but it is a fact of life. Now, yeah, that is one of the findings I did. Um, when I started uh, the project uh, maybe nine months ago or so, I thought that it is com it, it will result in complicated code because I didn't have the byte uh, access. And it turns out that this is not so. It, I mean, if you look at the code that I used to do the low level stuff, so to speak, to unpack the IP uh, packaging around the actual content of the message, it looks very different to your implementation, of course, but it is not a bit more complex or longer or mm -hmm. less efficient. <laughs> So in that respect, it was an interesting exercise. But as I said, uh, I, 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 I wasn't able to use your code. Only as a guideline to, to uh, try to understand, even if I didn't understand an RFC, I would look at your code and then mm -hmm. things would become clear. Right. I think that's, uh, um, yep, yeah, we're getting into Kind of break time now so well, um thank you very thank much you. thank you for chairing the mm -hmm. session glenn that was wonderful